I'm in. The 25th day of September. And we are celebrating the memory of our Holy Mother Frosini, daughter of Paphnutios the Egyptian, and her father, St. Paphnutios. This is the most ancient and first celebration of the day. And then we move on in time. Uh, the memory of the Holy Monk and Martyr of Paphnutios the Anchorite who was crucified in 303 and his 546 companions. I think last year we, we talked about Petrosini, or maybe St. Uh, Sergio Rodriguez is also today, but we're going to talk about somebody you probably haven't heard about. We also commemorate the great earthquake of Constantinople in 447 and the miracle of the Dresagon, which we're going to talk about. Very interesting. St. Sergio Rodriguez, the great wonder worker of the of Russia. What a tremendous saint. We'll talk about him just briefly because it, we covered him last year and uh, we're looking to talk about some more unknown saints to us this year. Memory of St. Ephrosini of Suzdal and memory of the Venerable Dositea, uh, the recluse of Kiev Caves. That's who we're going to talk about uh, today. Let me show you an icon of her. There she is. St. Dositea is the hermit of Kiev. Very important figure, although clearly unknown. But if we go back and we also mention the great saint, St. Saint Serge de Radonez, who was a was a uh, great monastic father, builder of many monasteries in Russia in the 14th century, before the fall of Constantinople. And here we have a list, you can see on the screen, of a list of the disciples, all saints. Uh, St. Abraham, St. Micah, St. Andronicus, St. Athanasius, St. Sava, St. Nikon, St. Paul. And that's a sign of a great, great monastic and holy father of the church, one of the most important. So I highly recommend all of you, over time, to get to know St. Sergius. We'll come back to him again next year, God willing. Uh, so, we have uh, also, before we get to the main thing today, I want to talk quickly about the mir miracle of the Trisagion. Have you ever wondered, where do we get this prayer, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us? Has anybody ever wondered about that? Go ahead. Okay, don't spoil it. I, I know you know, but I want everybody else to learn today. We're going to talk about that. Here's an image of the event. So uh, let's see if we can quickly re recount that. It's not a prayer that someone just sat down and thought up. This is a divinely revealed prayer. This is in the reign of Emperor Theodosius II. This is in the early 5th century, 400. Let's go to our timeline and remember where we are. So we're in the we're in the 400s, 5th century. So we're going to be, follow on the screen, we're going to be here. All right. This is just before the Synod of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, where it says 1451. Right? So we're in the early 400s. In fact, this by the time of that council, this prayer was pretty widespread and used. And uh, it became important in that, for the sake of the theology of the church in that council. So there was uh, a uh, continuous shaking in the city of Constantinople over a long period of time, and the city was filled with fear. It was uh, small earthquakes were happening over a long period of time. And the emperor and the patriarch, St. Prochorus, who was a disciple of St. John Chrysostom, uh, and all the people of Constantinople went in procession barefoot to the parade ground and of the Hebdomon, and they made earnest prayer to God for their safety. They were praying and asking God to protect the city from these, these terrible, uh, <coughs> frightful earthquakes that were happening. About the third hour, the ground once again sh shook, and a young boy who was suddenly taken up into the sky. Let's see if we can uh, see that. You see that icon there on the screen? Yeah. It's showing this event. There was a young boy who was suddenly taken up into the sky. Now, by the strength of the Almighty God, people were terrified. They started to scream out, Lord, have mercy. And when he came down from on high, the child declared that he had been taken up amid choirs of angels who were singing, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. And that a voice had commanded him to tell the patriarch that the people ought to make their supplications to God in this way, without adding anything. Without adding anything. Very important. You'll understand why a little bit later. 
So this was the prayer given by God directly to the people. The patriarch then instructed the chanters and the people to intone the hymn and chant the hymn. And choirs uh, uh, of, of people began to chant. And then joins confession. This hymn was joins confession of the three divine persons to the cry of the seraphim in the vision of Isaiah. So say in the Old Testament, prophet Isaiah had a vision of, had a vision of God. And this is connected to that vision. And it also shows the confession of the Orthodox people in three divine people. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's the core of everything we believe. So then the earth started to stop to shake, uh, stop shaking, and the child was given up his soul to God. God took his soul to heaven. Some might say, well, that's not very good. Well, why not? Isn't that the whole point of our life? To we'll go to heaven? God's providence brought the child up to heaven and then took his soul. By his divine wisdom, he understands when each, each person should leave this world to come and join him and await the resurrection of his body. And I, my guess is, and I'm not a prophet or uh, anything like that, but my guess is that this child, having seen such things, was protected from... Uh, pride and arrogance and falls uh, because he would have been seen as a very, very special person and it would have been a very difficult existence uh, if he had not had great, great humility. So he was a young child. But that's just my speculation. That's God's uh, wisdom alone knows what he, why he does what he does. So then the Most Pious Empress Pokhidia enjoined St. Proclus to order this hymn to be solemnly chanted henceforth in the Divine Liturgy. And that's why we tomorrow when we have Divine Liturgy, tomorrow morning everybody go to the chapel, right? We have Divine Liturgy. And we always chant for 1,000, almost 500 years now, we always chant Holy God, Holy Mind, Holy Mother, the Trisayan hymn in the Divine Liturgy. A little bit later, in 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, they... Uh, the fathers there grant, greeted the proclamation of the true faith by chanting the Trisagium. So now at that point it had really been received throughout the whole empire. People had adopted this. A little bit later, and this is what's very interesting, a little bit later there was a heretic, Peter the Fuller, his name, he, he became the patriarch of Antioch, and he wanted to, to uh, support a heresy, the Theopascite heresy, a type of monophysitism, the idea that we deny the divinity, the humanity of Christ, and he's only divinity, which is a heresy, which is not the Orthodox faith. What did he do? He took this hymn, and he added another phrase to it. Remember how, how the, the, the voice from heaven told the boy, do not add anything to this. Well, not long after that, just a few years after the Council of Chalcedon, he, Chalcedon, he added, who was crucified for us. So what does that mean? He was trying to make this whole prayer have to do with Christ. But they wanted to support the divinity of Christ and only the divinity of Christ and to the, to the detriment of his humanity. Well, the church rejected that. And uh, that's a, a very important historical uh, detail for the sake that we, do, we reject all different uh, monophysite heresies. Let's go on to our saint of the day. So now you've learned the origin of that prayer that we have in every divinity. We're going to talk about Saint Dositios. Even though the, the, her name her name is Dositheos, a man's name, you're going to see why in a minute. Her original name was Dositheia, and it was changed. So this is, uh, uh, let's start our, our, our history here real quick. This is 18th century, 1700s, or in the 1700s, 18th century in Russia. This is a pretty hard map to see here, but it shows the lava of St. Serge, where she was a monastic initially. Ryazan, where she was from. Sarah, where her, one of her, St. Sarah from Sarah came to her uh, myth. And then down here is Kiev, where she later became an ascetic, and here also an ascetic, and uh, not far from there. So these are some of the important cities in, the, in life. Uh, we're just going to talk in the beginning here a little bit about St. Sarah, because this is kind of puts us on the map. You've heard about St. Sarah from Sarah, yeah. right? We have a chapel in a parish dedicated to St. Sarah, and we have his icon on our chapel. Well, you're going to hear a little about how he began and how he set off the monastery. She was crucial in this whole, in his life. Uh, so there was a young man, his name was 
Prokhorosh, that's the future Saint Seraphim of Zerah, and he came from a family of virgins. He wanted to become a monk, so he went on pilgrimage to Kiev, and he sought to answer his prayers from God in, 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 from some, in, in, going by going on pilgrimage. And he was advised to go and visit the well-known hermit Dositheos, our saint today, who lived in a, in a, as a recluse in Kitaev, not far from Kiev. And he opened up his heart to her, and the answer that she gave, he, they thought, without his, his, her repose, they thought that she was a he, because he was, she was in the monastery for men, and she had sought refuge there. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the answer that she gave to him. Go, child of God, to the monastery of Sarov, and stay there. That place will be for you salvation. With God's help, there, will, there you will finish your human wanderings on earth. Only struggle to acquire the unceasing remembrance of God. Continuously call upon his name, saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the full version of the prayer that we say. Let all your attention and ascetic labor be turned toward this activity. Here what we see is that she was fully in the tradition of the Hesychas, which had been severely undermined in Russia. In Russia, there was a lot of secularism, and they had lost the Hesychastic tradition. And so people like her and others were bringing that back. And so she says, she sees in the future, she has the gift of clairvoyance, and she says, that's where you're going to go, and this is what you have to do there. Uh, let all of your attention be there while you're walking, when you're resting, standing in church. Have this unceasing prayer on your lips and in your heart. You will find rest in it and will acquire spiritual and bodily purity. That's the most important thing. We're going to have to have a spiritual life, we have to have spiritual and bodily purity, so then the Spirit of God will dwell in us. Then the Holy Spirit will abide in you, and you will lead your life in all piety and purity. In Sarov, the superior Pacomius leads a god pleasing life. He follows in the footsteps of our own Anthony and Theodosius. The Spirit will, the Holy Spirit will abide in you. This is how uh, he began his great walk. He became probably the greatest ascetic in the last 250 years in the Russian church. And it all began with her admonition, her clairvoyance. So let's go back and find out who's this mysterious nun who, lived, who was presenting herself as a monk. Well, she was born in 1721. Her grandmother was a, was a nun in a monastery, so she was pretty much raised until her grandmother became a great schema. In the Russian church, when the great schema is taken, they go into reclusion almost. And so she had to leave her grandmother, and had to go back to her parents. But when she was only 15 years old, she left. She departed. She evaded, evaded her parents. She didn't want to be married. Her parents wanted to marry her. And when she was 15, she left for... Let's bring up the icon there. You can see her. Uh, she left for the lava of St. Sergius. Remember the St. Sergius we were just talking about? Well, he had left the huge monastery. It's still the center of the Russian church. It's where they have the, the largest monastery, the largest seminary. It's really the center of the Russian church. So to this day, if you go to Russia, you're going to go to his monastery. And she went to that monastery. Not, it hasn't changed really much since that time. And she dressed as a young peasant, and she called herself Dositheos. So she presented herself as a man. She wanted to flee and not allow her parents to find her so she could live the monastic life. And she began to be working there in the monastery. Well, three years later, she fled in secret from the lava because she was afraid that her parents, maybe they had already come and looked for her, would find her. And she went to Kiev. Remember, she went from up there north of Moscow down to Kiev on the border then of Poland. We saw that in the map. Remember the map? Uh, we actually, we can go to Google Earth real quick make sure you understand. So this is the city that she was born in. You see that? For the eyes, huh? And it's just, here's Moscow. St. Sergius Monastery is just north, I think, of Moscow, if I'm not mistaken. And then, if you look on the map, she went down to Kiev, down there near the border with, uh, uh, that time, with Poland. So this is uh, quite a trip. She goes down, and she goes into the Lava of Kiev, enters a male monastery, there is where she lives, uh, there for a time, but they wouldn't receive her because she didn't have a passport. So she could not be kept legally. So she goes into a cave in Kitaev, 
and she lives in a cave. And she lives on bread and water. She, she, she is completely secluded during the Great Fast. And then at that time, she's only living on wild plants. Great asceticism. And through all of this love for Christ and asceticism, God gives her the gifts of clairvoyance and prophecy. These are the gifts of God to those who are pure, totally pure from all sin and evil thoughts. And she is, becomes well known. God starts to bring people to her, and she becomes well known as Dosithios the Hermit. And many people seek her out, but she is in reclusion, so people really don't understand much about her. She's kind of a mysterious figure. They don't understand that this is actually a woman. And the Empress Elizabeth Petrovna visits the, emperor, the Hermit in 1744. That's, that's only 23 years after her birth. She's just a young girl, young lady. And she's already an abbess, I mean, an eldress and, and counseling people. And she receives then the monastic tantra. She hadn't even, she hadn't even been, become a nun yet or a monk, right? Uh, so many times people think, well, all, what I really need to do is I need to get married. Or I need to become a monk. Well, yes, that's all going to happen in its time. What you need to do, every one of us needs to do, is struggle to love Christ. Struggle to keep the commandments. Struggle to remain pure. And if you do that, then you will have a wonderful marriage and a wonderful monastic life in time. So that's the important thing Elder Paisos and Manapha said. It's not important so much when or even if I'm tantric. It's that I live as a monk. That I live as an ascetic is what's important. This is exactly what was being lived out by our saint today. Then, <clears throat> that was about the story of Saint Seraphim coming to her. Another time, <coughs> there's just a few stories that are like Her sister comes searching for her and she's told, well, you ought to go see this Hermit, Dosithio, maybe he knows, she's, he's clairvoyant, maybe he knows where your sister is. So he, she comes to her, Dosithio, who is actually her sister, and what does is, what is her sister say, Dosithio, say to her? Um, well, you should not seek your sister any longer. She has gone into hiding in order to serve God. Go on, go on with your life. That would have been hard, don't you think? Would have been hard, you seeing your sister? That would have been a temptation to reveal yourself, but she did not do that. And then there was a time, which was kind of, I've never heard of this, it's just the first time I've ever seen this, but there was a time during this time of secularization in the church in Russia, the state of Russia, uh, there was, uh, the, there were, the hermits were forbidden. There was no blessing to be a hermit. You had to go to a monastery. Well, this was not going to happen for this saint. Obviously, she was living according to the will of God, and this was not something that, that was a God of command. And so she left, and she went to the far caves of the Labra of Kiev. So she went to it and hid in there, and she, she began again to receive, at the time, many visitors. And so for four years she was there, and she went back to Kitaya, where she was previously. And she settled there in a remote cell, far away from people. And there... <clears throat> The monk Theophan served her, became a disciple of her, him, and then he, she sent him to the great St. Paisos Velutskovsky. Do you remember we talked about him last year? In fact, we took a pilgrimage to this monastery not, not far. Uh, there he is. Paisos yeah. Velutskovsky. So let's see the picture here. Do you remember this saint? I don't know if you remember him from last year. That is a great, great Hesychus who brought from Nanathos and from Romania and sent disciples to Russia and brought the whole Hesychus core of the church to Russia. So she sends her, her disciple to him, uh, her, her disciple to St. Paisios, and he stays with St. Paisios and he returns to Russia and he becomes a saint in, in, his, own, in his own right, Theophar a great uh, practicer of the Hesychus tradition, and this is one of the ways that the Athenite Hesychus tradition has spread throughout Russia, so it's very, very important. Uh, so when her time to depart this life comes, this is how she, re re she prepares herself and how she leaves this world. This is a sign of a, a person of God, a man of God, a woman of God, and uh, this is what we pray for. In every divine liturgy, if you pay attention to the positions, we're praying for a, a, a blessed end to this life. So, she understands that it's time to leave this life. God informs her. 
they went, uh, she went and greets the brethren of the skeet. There were other hermits and other monks living. She greets them. She returns to her cell and she spends the whole night praying and reading the Psalter. And on the morning of the 26th of September, 1776, if you remember, what was happening in 1776? Was there anything important in, in America happening in 1776? Yeah? What was that date? Mary? Constitution. The Revolution, not yet the Constitution, the American Revolution. So this is the time when America is fighting to get its independence, or the Americans are fighting to get independence from the Crown in England. The same year she reposes, and she reposes, and she's found the next day or sometime with she's on her knees before an icon, and there's a piece of paper in her hand, and it has the message: "My body is ready for burial." I beg you not to touch it, but to bury it uh, in the usual way. And why do you think she wrote that? Why did she write that note? Because she's a woman. Right. So she's, uh, these are men that are coming to bury the body. She doesn't want to scandalize them. She doesn't want them to know that she was uh, not a male monastic. Mm -hmm. But after her death, it was discovered, doesn't say how here, that she was a woman. And, of course, they're in great awe of this, uh, this exceptional uh, ascetic feat. And uh, her, her disciples say, Theophan leaves for the monastery of Solovsky in northern Russia. And as I said before, he becomes, becomes a great practitioner and teacher of the, uh, the prayer. Did, who, did anybody know who this saint is? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, that saint, Sarah, the young boy, Prokhodos, who came to her, Got a blessing to go to Sarah. She actually sent him to be a monk there. That's a, that was uh, Saint Josephus. So this is our saint today. I want you, want you to remember this saint because most Orthodox Christians, my guess is most Orthodox Christians in many parts of the world don't know much about her or anything because she's not that well known outside of Russia. Uh, but it's, uh, it's she's a wonderful, important saint and a very, very instructive for us. Uh, did you like that life today? Was that interesting for you? Very different, isn't it? Very interesting and different. Uh, every everyone has their own path, and God, is, if God is working with them, it's going to be unique. And so we have the same thing. It's kind ahead. of like that other one with her, and she had to live out of the monastery with her son. Right, just a few days ago we talked about her. Remember how she took refuge in a men's monastery, <coughs> Mount Alexandria, seen. So, any questions? Any thoughts? Sophia? Mary? Go ahead. Um, what did Maria? You say? But, um, what was it? Mary and Maria? Go ahead. When you said, say, um, in the beginning, like when we were talking about the first miracle that happened, you said one of the people's name was Peter of. Or, Peter? Yeah. Oh, that was one of the, that was the heretic monophysites. Yeah. Yeah, his name was uh, Peter the Fuller, is his name. He was the patriarch of Antioch. Yes, go ahead, Maria. You want to ask something about that? You want to ask something about that? Okay, go ahead, Maria. Uh, uh, why did she uh, pretend to be a man all her life? So that, she went, the question is, why did she pretend to be a man? Well, there was probably two reasons. One was that she could hide from those relatives who wanted to take her out of the monastery. So she thought, if I go there, nobody will suspect that I've fl fled. She wanted to lead that life, and they didn't want her to. Do you remember how um, we said yesterday that we have to love our enemies? Do you remember that? Was St. Simon? Yeah. Everybody remember that? Come yeah. On. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Let's hope that we're remembering these things. It's very important. Well, the Lord says your enemies are in your own household sometimes. Right? What does that mean? That there are going to be people who are fighting against you. They don't want you to devote yourself to Christ, to be a Christian, to live the life. They don't understand it, and so they don't want you. Many times you see that, that the young people have to leave the house, leave their parents in order to live for God. That's the only time, really, maybe a few other exceptions, but that's really the only time when we can disobey our parents, right? Because they're not doing what God's will is. If we're seeking to be with God and serve Him, so this is what happened, Maria. She had to leave the parents because they didn't understand. They didn't want her to be with God. So she had to do that. And that's why she was pretending to be a man. 
Uh, and then by God's providence, she became very well known. That, that was quite a feat, just to remain unknown and to maintain that all your life. That's a, quite a feat uh, of, of patience and humility. All right, if there's no other questions, I've run late, so we'll end today. So the prayers of our Holy Mother, and the Jesus, 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 and the Jesus,